what if all of the TV shows you watched, all the movies you watched, everything that you watched on your phone, all the texts you send, all the websites you visit, were suddenly made public for everyone you know to see. We've seen kind of hints of that in when there was that one site where married men would seek out affection where they put the whole list of people who had signed up out public. Well, what if that happened to where everything that we brought in through our eyes and sent to others electronically was made public? The reality is, is it will be made public. God says what is done in the secret it will be shouted from the rooftop so it will be made public either on this side of heaven or on the other side of heaven. We will be laid bare, everything will be known. So the question is, would you be fearful if that happened or would you know that there's nothing that you have hidden and that you are completely safe because there's nothing that would be seen or heard that would show you to be a fraud at all in any way in your relationships in your honor of Jesus your honor of other humans you're either going to panic or you're going to be fine there's very few other options for that what's troubling is that somehow in the way relationships go with Jesus, people feel that there are several different options for a relationship with Christ. I often hear, Jesus is my Savior, I have not yet made him Lord, which is definitely not an option. That is lost, according to Jesus. If we are genuine in our relationship with him, we don't have any fear of anything private in our lives being laid bare. We are not afraid of that. If someone is scared of it happening, all of their, let's just say, text messages being exposed publicly, then you need to listen further about what that means between you and God. Because God never made an option for people to claim to be a Christian, but not to live out their faith according to exactly how he requires it. He paid an exact price and he gave exact details on how that needs to be received. And claiming faith in Jesus Christ is not enough. There's a lot more that's required. Genuine, not fake Christianity mandates that we live faithfully for him and only for Jesus. And cultural Christianity, as many have signed on to, is a myth. And believing you can be a Christian like you can be a Norwegian or an Italian is a lie. And no one can afford to gamble with that lie because it is an eternal price. It's equal to entering into a marriage fully intending to give up all personal rights to your own life. That's what Christianity is. It is a marriage and it is a joining together. It is a complete union of every kind. We do everything together. That is what becoming a Christian requires at the entrance. And if you have not done that, you don't have it. You may believe in Jesus. You may read the Bible every day. You may go to church every day. But if you have not come into a covenant with Jesus like that, you are not what the Bible calls born again. You fall into a category of what's called the religious in the Bible. And Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. And the context of this verse in the Bible makes it very clear that this is not Jesus speaking or appealing to unbelievers. Jesus is not asking those who don't know him to put their faith and trust in him to open the door to their hearts to accept him. These people are already church members. They're already part of God's family, but they're not saved. They're lukewarm Christians, according to the Bible. They're going through motions and their faith is a hobby. 
Jesus is actually asking those claiming to be his people already to open the door to their hearts for a genuine and consistent walk with him, something they have not done. He wants them to be saved. Currently, they are not. He wants his followers to want deep fellowship with him that can be both exciting and refreshing. He wants them to listen to him, to follow his lead, to willingly and enthusiastically serve him with sincerity. He wants his followers in the eternal church to make their faith real and to give up their lives of going through the motions spiritually and believing in Jesus, as they say, without full engagement. It is not an option. The Christian is one who follows Jesus Christ and has taken on the instructions, directions, guidance, and characteristics that Jesus has given to us. And self-righteousness is the opposite of that in religious, the real people who choose to be religious instead of surrendering to Jesus. And it's a very dangerous path to take. It authorizes pride and makes one of the first things that shows up with that is that people start making levels of people where at the cross there are no levels everyone is the same in importance but people who are self-righteous they start making categories of who's less than who the lowest are the large group of who they are better than that they have more favor with god they have attained a higher status in their faith they are a better christian they are more obedient what they don't realize is they are unable to take in and learn from god they certainly do not realize how sinful they are i often tell people the ones who are judging those in addiction do not realize their sin of judging themselves as better than that person is far greater than the addiction oftentimes. This group see themselves more deserving of mercy and forgiveness than the person who committed murder, who abuses children, who, or who was simply lost in addiction. And they fell for the lie that allowed them to believe that they were more honorable and more worthy of Jesus and of the earthly benefits of heaven and they have allowed their accomplishments and achievements to cause the sin of pride that cuts them off from the god who despises their self-righteousness they don't even know how much god hates what they're doing because they have cut themselves off from the reality of that and for all of those who exalt themselves they will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted is what god says in luke 18:14 god calls all to repent and that is to understand that our lives of playing games with spirituality has got to end he will not tolerate it in his real family we're all equally filthy in his eyes and he makes that very clear there's nothing good in us he doesn't want anything from our life only jesus is sufficient and he's looking for zealous or totally committed followers who are both fervent and refreshing servants of the most high god who know they have nothing good in themselves to offer. He calls that mediocre Christianity lukewarm Christians and it angers God. Cultural Christianity is often used to describe someone who claims to be a Christ follower, but their lifestyle does not truly match what they profess. Checkbooks, phones, television, will all show what kind of a Christian you really are. And if you even are a Christian, because those three things alone will show your respect for Jesus. And many want people to think they are Christians, but in reality, they have not put their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. Many think I have him as savior. I prayed this prayer and he's my savior. But unless you abandon self and turn from sin, that prayer is pointless. They live according to their own plans and they give Sunday morning a few hours to God. They give a few moments during the week to him. They also have maybe a religious hobby or two where they go do these certain things. But they don't have an abiding 24-7 
commitment to their groom where they are constantly aware of his interaction and his presence in their life, what they do, what they say. About two thirds of the United States claim to be Christian, but less than half and a rapidly declining half actually participate in any kind of organized Christian church. And when they're asked about their spiritual beliefs, many list Christianity as their religion of choice. The reasons that they give for choosing Christianity as their religion of choice is that they were born into a Christian family. They had a religious experience during their childhood or at some other point, or the selection of religious affiliation is simply listed on the form and it feels like the most likely choice of all the choices. Some probably declare themselves to be Christian because it helps them gain a trusted reputation for whatever business they're trying to make money. And I've talked to many people who have actually done that where they have guided, well, when I used to be out in the bars, which was a long time and a long time ago and for a long time, I knew at happy hour because of the kind of job I had, we networked during happy hour, that some of the people said that they go to church simply because they gain a lot of customers by appearing in church. So here they are at the bar all the time too, but they said, my going to church every Sunday brings in more customers than any bar that I frequent. So often people use church, they use other forms of Christianese to make money, to gain favor, to build a reputation, again, all will be laid bare and this will all be exposed. Hopefully before you die, because if it's after, you have no chance to change it. There's a big difference in claiming to be a Christian and to somehow fit into a culture actually having faith in Christ or the person who actually lives faithfully, consistently, and devoted to Jesus. There is a huge difference between those two groups of people. The end result of the two groups is also very different. One group will see hell, the other group will see heaven for eternity. That's how big of a difference there is in how God sees it. Jesus shows his anger at the hypocrisy of the religious leaders who only cared about appearances. They took care of everything that people could see and they took pride in what was visible to people, but they neglected what God could see. They painted the outside, leaving the inside full of greed and self-indulgence, according to Matthew 23, 25. And in their own eyes, they were holy, and the condition of their hearts were far better than most of the people around them. And Jesus confronted them as fake and dangerous leaders who did not practice what they preached. He called them the whitewashed tombs and that they were leading themselves and others to death and separation from God. And they often only called out specific sins, this type of religious leader, because if they called out for example, fornication, adultery, porn addiction, drug addiction, different common sins that are in the church, they would lose followers, they would lose money, so they don't touch these things. They left many, uh, many prevalent sins untouched for the sake of keeping the size of their kingdom and keeping finances coming in. They give a shadow of what is required to make heaven to many who are there needing to know the truth, but they don't want to offend, so they share a shadow, or they don't get into what, what repentance really requires, or when they invite people into the kingdom, they don't tell them the whole story about, you can pray this prayer, but if you don't leave everything about yourself at this altar and go out and worship Jesus with every choice from now on it meant nothing it accomplished nothing because you have to lay down your life to have his so what they then end up 
giving people is not the truth and people think that as they sit there listening to all these different sermons that are positive and um, helpful and different points that are probably helpful if people were genuinely saved but many are not those who do this are storing up a terrible judgment for themselves in the end because all again will be laid bare and if you are a steward of the gospel and you are not making it very clear to those who are even having hidden sin you will be held responsible and those meeting the definition of whitewashed conceal and cover flaws failures blemishes and any unpleasant facts that won't help their image they keep their sins and details that others might not like about them hidden completely from view and rather than focusing on and living in the glory of Jesus Christ people search for where they can serve in a ministry to look good for others when if all was laid bare and the motives of why they're there and their behavior in privacy were to be revealed for the whole world to see many people would be shocked at who they're trusting as a spiritual leader and this happens to many people and then people turn on them so it's never quite as serious when a, a ceo of a company is arrested for prostitution as a pastor of a church who's arrested for prostitution or child abuse that makes front news where if it's someone else who's not clergy, it probably won't even make the news. People get angered when this happens and they turn on the person, but they also turn on God. And that's why it's very dangerous to be living a double life when you're representing Jesus because God is angered. And if people find it out, they are angered. And people who walk in the spirit they can feel it on people. They know who the duplicious people are because the Holy Spirit tells them. So they have to be teaching a group that is not sensitive to the Holy Spirit because they only look at the appearance. James 4, 6, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. The humble have deleted themselves from the equation. It is all for Jesus, nothing for me. That's what the humble feel. They live in the light and it will be shown one day for exactly what it is. Everyone who is humble and everyone who isn't but is portraying themselves as humble. And pride, kind of the gatekeeper of all sins, leads many to assume that we deserve more than we have and that we're suited for greater positions in ministry. So when people get out of seminary or Bible school, they are a little miffed if they have to start at the bottom and just do like an administrative job or in even a secular job because they've got this ministry degree somehow people feel entitled to the what they dreamed to become as they went to school we're entitled to nothing it creates a greedy craving for more than what they have and more than what's good for them because their character nowhere matches the position that they crave and God says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. In 1 Peter 5, 6, if you want to get there the right way, you serve. You serve. You start, uh, say, if the janitor's position is open, I'll take that. If you need someone to clean, dust, sweep, I'll take that. I will do what is needed in this church. I will, do, I will take care of babies. I will take care of children i will do where do you need me and that's the person that god's going to promote that one not the one who mandates certain honored positions we often stress over our position and our status because many want recognition for the position that they hold and god's acknowledgement is far more valuable and the reward comes with his far greater than any human applause that you will get this side of heaven Many who are going to, who have sought after and acquired human applause, this is all they get. If they are driving around 
and showing off and flaunting the riches they have gained from the kingdom, often from very poor people, this is the best they'll ever have it. Because unless they repent and lay down their life and their desires for Jesus and match his character, heaven is not their future home. We are to obey God and pay no attention to how it may look where we are currently serving. We are grateful to be there, grateful to be in any position serving others. It doesn't matter how lowly it may seem, we're grateful to be there. God will lift that person up in this life and the next life. That humility is what blesses him more than anything else. And this life is a vapor in comparison to the next. I've said it before, it's baffling how people watch numbers every day. They watch that stock market, they watch investments. They are just glued to these screens because they don't want to miss one dollar that they could make, but they give no thought to what's coming. And oftentimes they die at a age earlier than they should have. And then they find out nothing transferred ahead of them. None of that money is worth anything to them in eternity. What it will show is that they traded greed for Jesus and they will miss money and Jesus for eternity. They won't get anything. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus explained that the law was less about what to do and not to do, and more about changing the heart. The law reveals uncleanness, but it has no power to make a person righteous. Only God can do that. And a Pharisee Christian, they look in the mirror and they paint themselves to match what they feel a good Christian is to look like. And the fake cleanness of whitewashed tombs cannot ever compare to the deep cleaning of the blood of Jesus Christ in 1 John 1, 7, that washes away all sin, that washes away deception, that washes away all the pride and allows us to see our filth in comparison to Jesus Christ. Then we know we have nothing to stand on. We have no entitlements. We deserve nothing. At that point, once we have applied the blood of Jesus to our lives, then we know who we are, what we are, and that we are just privileged to have Jesus even turn his head towards us. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace, according to Ephesians 1, 7. The Pharisees believed that performance was the way to please God. That was one group of religious people, and they focused on performance. The other group, the Sadducees, they believed that human reasoning and human wisdom was the way to understand and please God. And these two parties were often at odds. Neither one of them qualified as Christ followers because neither one of them could agree with him or each other. Those who develop all kinds of programming and different types of um, steps. I have, now that we're actually in prayer ministry and you realize, I don't know how people do it with these different steps and models and because I don't know, with as random as it is, I don't know how that even works. And I am not against that, but I don't know how it works. I just know that in my life as a believer and with what God has called me to be part of, there's not gonna really be any set way on how that's gonna go. There's no room or provision for the supernatural in either one of these types, the Pharisees or the Sadducees, there is nothing allowed for the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And they often deny it. They don't even believe in it. And sadly, many Christian organizations don't allow the Holy Spirit to be present either. And their main reason is they don't want the Holy Spirit in control because he's in control. And when he is, 
no one else is. And if you even allow his presence to take over in a church, you can't set a schedule because he's in control and he doesn't set a schedule, not around man anyway. So most churches, simply because they need to be scheduled, because people want a schedule, they want to know what time they're done, they need to go pick up or go to lunch or something, the church many times feels forced into, we have to schedule this. Our church needs to have order. And because the Holy Spirit isn't predictable and nobody really wants to be that church that appears to be out of control and the Holy Spirit is spontaneous, they will rely on their human reasoning, their human wisdom, just like the Sadducees, to try to accomplish the works of God in their church today or their ministry today fitting everything into a tidy box so that it's going to happen at exactly this minute. They don't want any crazy stories coming out. They don't want people filming anything that could go on the news or YouTube or if there's like some kind of crazy, somebody falls down or they don't want that. They speak of the necessity of order in the church and they find many verses in the Bible to actually support that as most of the congregation sits unchanged and unchallenged. They don't even, they have no idea they are not alive. They have no idea that they are not following Jesus the way the Bible requires. And most have no idea they are not ready for judgment day. Ezekiel 13 says, because they lead my people astray saying peace when there is no peace. And because when a flimsy wall is built, they cover it with whitewash. Therefore, tell all those who cover it with whitewash that it's going to fall. Rain will come in torrents and I will send hailstones hurling down and violent winds will burst forth. And when the wall collapses, will people not ask you, where's the whitewash you covered it with? I will tear down the wall you have covered with whitewash. I will level it to the ground so that its foundation will be laid bare. When it falls, you will be destroyed in it and then you will know that I am the Lord. So I will pour out my wrath against the wall and against those who covered it with whitewash. I will say to you, the wall is gone, and so are those who whitewashed the wall. Proverbs 28, 13 to 14 says, you can't whitewash your sins and get away with it. You find mercy from God by admitting your sins and leaving them. And a whitewashed Christian or a Pharisee is generally pretty proud of himself as a Christian. He thinks things like, I am not as other men are. He has a list of things that he can say, look at what I am not. Look at what they are and I am not. He says things of himself. I'm no longer a drug addict. I'm no longer a drunk. I'm no longer immoral. I no longer look like a sinner like they do, like my friends did. I don't go to bars. I don't frequent the drug dealer. I give tithes and offerings to ministries now with my money. Others seek me out because I have attained the success in life that they desire. Look at what I do. Look at what I have. This person is self-righteous and fake, according to Jesus. You then... Why do you judge your brother and sister or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Romans 14, 10. And all of your thoughts, all of your motives, all of your judgments of others, all of your, it's all going to be made known. You will see it. You can stand in front of God and you originally thought you were one of the better people to come into heaven, but by the time he's done showing you who you are, you won't have a word to say. You will have no defense. Just think about what you think about during the day. Think about just what you think about. And then think about how much of that time is spent thinking about Jesus, bringing others to Jesus, loving others so that they know they are loved by Jesus, even the worst sinners. Think about how much of your time is spent thinking about that compared to what else you think about. 
do not live by the culture of any church or ministry if it doesn't match what Jesus requires, which is deny yourself, all of yourself, your past, your present, your future, lay it all down. We are to dislike the sin. We are to love the sinner. I don't care how much you're disgusted by their flavor of sin. We are called to love them. And many claiming Jesus judge others in the world by how they live. We all know the specific groups that get called out and, and called out and called out and exposed and called out. But that's not what we're supposed to be doing. Sinners sin. That's what people forget. Sinners sin. If they somehow think they're a Christian, we still need to love them until they come to Jesus and realize they weren't. We're called to reach out to them with the love of Christ because those who are not in Christ, we know who they are, love them. We need to bring them to Christ and judging them and persecuting them and calling them sinners is not going to bring them to Christ. And we were once one of them. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Matthew 6, 5. So when we seek God, pray to God, or do service, we are not trying to be viewed as heavenly or holy or standing out to be noticed, going to public squares to be seen by all. Again, there are... There's no issue with showing what a ministry is doing, but when you're doing it to be seen for what you are doing, that's a motive issue that God will expose. A good reputation comes from serving and giving yourself to help God and others. Service is what keeps us mindful of other people's needs. It helps us remember where we came from. If we ever did realize we came from sin, it also prevents us from focusing on ourselves. Jesus came to earth as a servant. He modeled it. He, he was from heaven. He was God. Yet he came to earth as a servant. He came in the lowest position he could have come in to set an example for the rest of us. We are not called to elevate ourselves. We are not entitled to a position over others. I struggle when I see people surrounded by... Um, security teams in ministry you can't even get close to them because they have all these people around them to keep them from the little folk we need to remember that jesus came as a servant he had no pillow for his head half the time he set the example he told us to be like him he said do what i do so it causes a bit of a divide when you look at the entitlements of certain people who claim to be voices for the kingdom jesus never took any of those rights we need to really look at is this how i want to meet jesus as this person who thinks of myself this way and who wants to stay separated from the others so i don't get tired burned out burdened with too many little problems when I have to run the big thing. You didn't hear Jesus say any of that. A Pharisee or a whitewashed Christian will, one, lack the ability to receive correction. They say, I know what I'm doing. I don't need your help. Don't tell me how to do this. I know what I'm doing. Two, they see wrong in others, but not in themselves. He did not help us with this ministry. He's not focused right for this ministry. This is just not someone that we want here. He's not quite like us. That can be, there can be those people with those issues, but we should not be focused on looking at the wrong in others. There should always be a period of being able to teach and pull them forward. Three, we feel that we are appointed to fix other people and we need to follow a process. Many people have expectations of those who aren't meeting their 
requirements. Marriage often does this to people. They marry someone and they expect them to be in this certain lane. You need to be this for me. I married you because I wanted this from you. You did this when we were dating. It also happens in coworker situations. Unmet expectations that are unrealistic cause more problems than just about anything else and we need to not have them. You should have expectations of fellow believers, but we should not be allowing our relationships to be driven by expectations that we need for ourselves. For they feel closer to God than others. They're not where they need to be because they think I'm closer to God than that person. That's a good indicator something is very wrong. They seek recognition for what they have done. So performance is a big thing. You'll see all the titles after their name. You'll see all these things they accomplished. Um, there's long lists and books of things that they did successfully. They want recognition. And the Bible says that's all they're going to get. He won't repeat it up there if they took it down here. Some people probably did a lot of things here, but they took their recognition here in front of man and they canceled it out for eternity. The position and the honor they could have had in heaven if they would have been humble and let God be their reward, they won't get it now. They'll just be escaping in through the flames. Six, they have righteousness without a relationship with Christ. They feel that they're good people. And there is a large group that is in this. They feel, I am a good person. I am much better in the church than those people. We sit over here because those people sit over there and we don't want to catch what they have. So we sit over here. I've actually talked to people like this and this church is blessed to have me because I bring so much to the church. They also feel if this is another indicator of trouble, if your prayer life is routine and it's your life is void of the supernatural power of God or the expectation of it, something's very wrong. You are not connected to the real Jesus because the real Jesus is extending us the power that raised him from the dead, that shook the earth, that rolled the stone, all of those things. That's what's available to us. He wants us to believe in it, walk in it, expect it, and bring his supernatural power into reality here on earth. So if you're not doing that, you're not connected to the real Jesus. You have formed a Jesus that fits into your little box, and that is not the Jesus that's in heaven. Another is we have become or limited or redefined the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. There is nothing man can do to limit him without excluding him completely because he's not going to accept our modified version of a schedule. He's in or he's out. He's ruling or he's not. Another spirit is if he's not. And that's what's concerning because it's generally religion. It has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit because he doesn't have an equal that's anywhere out there. We deserve more or those people who do that Holy Spirit ministry, we don't want them here. They get kind of crazy. They don't follow the rules. When it's not the Holy Spirit ministry people that aren't following the rules, they're following the Holy Spirit. They're trying to see people radically transformed. They're trying to see sin completely eradicated from people's lives. They're trying to see deliverance. They want demons evicted. But a lot of times the process isn't a neat, tidy little service that people prefer to have. So they have redefined they talk about the Holy Spirit, but he is not welcome. And the evidence of the body of the church and what comes out of it is clear. It isn't growing. It isn't producing radical disciples for Jesus Christ. It's not 
sending people out into the highways and the byways of the community, bringing people into the church, it's not doing any of those things because the Holy Spirit has been so limited that he's waiting outside the door. Another, we're too busy polishing our reputation to see those who are broken around us. We think, look at how bright my light shines. It's no wonder people look at me all the time because my light is so bright. I'm doing so well. And they forget it's not about that at all. It's about the broken. It's about serving the broken. Revelation 3, 11 to 22 describes the church of the Laodiceans with this serious indictment. I wish that you were hot or cold. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And one could think that being hot spiritually is what this is speaking of. And they could also think that it is somehow acceptable to be cold spiritually by how that's worded. A term that could be understood as lifeless or dead, that somehow Jesus is approving of that. But he is not telling them that at all. He's not saying it's appropriate to be cold spiritually. There is no such thing. This verse can sound somewhat confusing, but the people of Laodicea knew exactly what Jesus was saying because their city was known for its lukewarm water supply and other cities nearby them did not have that problem. Some had hot water, the hot springs of water that contained therapeutic or medicinal value, hot mineral water that actually brought healing to people. Another close city enjoyed cold and refreshing mountain spring water. But Laodicea did not have that. Their water was dirty and lukewarm. And that's why they could easily grasp what Jesus was saying to their church. To be hot was to be fervent and helpful. To be cold was refreshing and invigorating. But to be lukewarm was undesirable, dirty, useless, and nobody wants it, including Jesus. It means that being average and not living fervently for Jesus, not serving him with all your energy and enthusiasm, but going through the motion spiritually, being content pursuing wealth and materialism has resulted in leaving people completely unaware of their spiritual poverty. And I can tell you this shows up in the details. If sporting events or movies, TV shows, any kind of entertainment gets you more excited or more enthusiastic in your display than kingdom building and bringing people to Christ, you are exposing yourself as lost or lukewarm. You're exposing yourself here. It won't even need to happen at the end. You are already showing it here that there are things far more exciting to you then Jesus, those you love going to heaven for eternity, you're showing all kinds of excitement about a momentary event, while many of those around you probably enjoying the same thing and watching your excitement are going lost, some probably in the next year, and you have no concern. It's not even on your mind. That is lost and deceived and not evidence of a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying it's not okay to get excited about sports and games, but it better not trump how you handle being around things that are God's events and what God is doing. That has to be the top, top excitement in our lives. Often Jesus called them wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Their hypocritical and impressive works as they saw it were not sincere and God did not want them because they were not done with a pure heart and he rejects them. In 1 Peter 4, 16, it says, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. And Peter's explaining what is most likely true in definitely in other countries and it's soon to come here that Jesus followers genuine Jesus followers will suffer persecution for their faith Paul repeats this in 2nd Timothy 3 12 
all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And Peter tells believers to assume that they will experience persecution for their beliefs. He also tells them to rejoice while going through these times of suffering because that will give them the opportunity to glorify God in front of others who may not know him. They would be much more watchful of someone who's being persecuted honoring Jesus than one who's just living a great life, living their best life as we're taught to do in America. And sadly, much of the persecution against the true Jesus followers does come from the Pharisees, just as it did in Jesus' day. The religious are the hardest on genuine Jesus followers. Our faith must be genuine. It must be real and authentic and not faked. There is no verbal claim to be a Christian unless it is completely authentic and there are requirements. A genuine Christian will live their faith in public. You don't get to have this private, I don't want to offend people, I don't want people turned off by my faith. They can't be turned off by something they don't even know you have. You can't be persecuted if you're not even risking, you're afraid of turning off people. The very people that you will get to see that you helped go to hell because you were more concerned about not offending them, you were willing to offend God. Your faith is so real as a genuine Christian that your lifestyle lights up everything you believe. It's a clear visual aid to everybody around you, to those who think they're Christians, but they're not, they will be very offended but you are one everyone can see walks closely with Jesus. If you are a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, everyone will know that you love Jesus more than yourself. A genuine Christian will share their faith with other people. This is a must in the lives of true believers today. And I have been argued with over this, saying I'm an evangelist, therefore it's on me, but not everyone else. Wrong. One of the last things Jesus said was to all to go and share. Everyone is expected to share the gospel. Social media has made that have one million different ways to do that. There's going to be no excuse for anyone that doesn't because there are so many different ways. You can sit in a chair and you're kitchen and share Jesus more than anyone. Genuine Christ followers share their faith in Jesus Christ. He expects it. A genuine Christian will stand for Jesus during times of suffering. We're not afraid of suffering. We don't necessarily like suffering, but we're not afraid of suffering and persecution because God gives us opportunities to live for Jesus in these times, to tell others about him and to bring great honor to him and in difficult times it lights up more than ever jesus himself suffered at the hands of his enemies and true christ followers will suffer persecution for living and following jesus and the bible says this he didn't like he didn't hide that he said that would happen but this life is short the next one is forever so if you are going to choose to make this one comfortable the next one won't be. If you choose to live this one up and build the kingdom, the next one's going to be incredible. Those who only claim to be a Christian that won't suffer persecution, they're not willing, they say they are not up to the part of persecution, they do not have real faith. Their choice is to please man, and they often seek to patch up offenses they cause when they do share bits of the true gospel. They don't want people angry. They don't want people offended at them. So they go back and clean it up and make peace with that person and negate the conviction that it brought. The word naturally brings it. That person, there will be no reward because they ended up choosing to please man over pleasing God. The word does its own work. We don't need to apologize for it. 
every true believer has a lifestyle of personal and corporate worship. And when we worship God, we use our entire life, our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. According to Matthew 22, 37, and 38, we are to always bring glory to and show God to everyone who is around us for who he is and for everything he has done. And obedience in our lifestyle is required for worship. This is not about church worship services or concerts. If you are getting all wound up at concerts, but you are not living in obedience, it is a complete fraud. There is nothing about your worship that is real, except that the music got you excited. That's it. If there's a spirit involved, it's not the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit wants obedience. He's not focused on the music. He's focused on does your life show that you love me more than anything else? That is a prerequisite for real worship. So concerts, you can call them worship, but if your lifestyle and your choices don't worship Jesus as a pattern, there's nothing about that concert that's worship for you, except of your own experience. It's a sensational experience for you. Every believer's life should also involve biblical and honest community or fellowship. Every follower of Jesus Christ needs to have a relationship with other Christians for encouragement, accountability, and friendship, and to bear one another's burdens. According to Galatians 6.2, the worst thing for a human soul is to be lonely. And many who come to Christ oftentimes recognizing their sin, otherwise they couldn't come to Christ if they didn't know they had to recognize and repent of their sin, end up staying with the friends that they had previous to the decision to turn to Christ. And because they stayed with the world, their salvation died. The seed that was planted that rooted died and Jesus warned about this in Luke when he said sowing of the seed if you didn't eliminate a lot of these risks cares of this world temptations pleasures the seed's going to die and many return back to sin and step away from Jesus after what could have been a beautiful relationship because they would not leave their worldly friendships. Each believer needs to be serving others in ministry, and this is a privilege granted to those who follow Christ. Pastors and leaders in the church equip those in their church to use their time, energy, abilities, and resources to serve others. And part of being a spiritual leader is helping others know what their giftings are and how to best use them. And this is a practical way for us to follow Jesus' command to love your neighbor as yourself, as well as Paul's words to serve one another in love. Service is required. Every single real Christian is called to do ministry in every way that they can in order that the gospel is proclaimed, the kingdom is built, and Jesus is glorified here on earth, just as he is in heaven. We are commanded to bear fruit as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus expects this from us. Those who do not bear fruit that, are, that meet that will be thrown into the fire. He says that. Every true follower of Jesus, their life should represent a mission. His final command to his disciples was to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. We will use what we have to go wherever we can to reach other people for the gospel of Christ. And if there's something else going on and suddenly you get the call that someone is ready to receive Christ, you better take it. I can't imagine anything else being worth more than that. There is no higher calling than to meet that call right there. The devil will snatch that away if it's not met. This is all about discipleship and every church that is gonna last until the end and be engaging and alive is currently very focused on discipleship and equipping their members to be 
disciplers of others to bring in to create to build that is why the church was created so it's not somewhere to go to worship not where you go to join others the church has a function and in these last days the church needs to be a discipleship hub for others spiritual maturity is something that needs to be the priority of every single follower of christ and many people claim to be christians but they're at best a fan of jesus definitely not a follower of jesus the entire world lost even the lost know when someone's a follower of jesus i went from being a radical sinner to a radical follower of jesus and trust me people pointed it out to me long before i ever could see the changes in myself they were very concerned that I was no longer going to be in the same places. I did not know that yet, but they said, this means you can't go here. This means you can't do this. This means you can't this. And I thought, really? I wasn't completely aware of all that, but my worldly sinning friends were the ones that told me, well, now you can't do that. Now look what you've done. So the world often before the Christians know what a Christian is supposed to act like. The Christians are the ones who neutralize that message and make excuses for themselves to be where the world knows they should not be. And in eternity, it's going to make a difference between heaven or hell, not just for the ones who compromise Jesus as a lifestyle, but for all of those who choose to use them as an excuse to do the same. Mark 8.34 then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. And that is the only group of people that is ready for the momentary and very soon return of Jesus Christ. We are very passionate about people coming into the kingdom in a true way, not a way that just makes you a fraud. There's many that do that also. If you are wanting and not knowing who to call for help in that area, we would be privileged to help you. So never hesitate to reach out to us. Precious Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you that I am not in hell because I should be, I earned hell so many times over and I. Thank you even more that I knew that because so many people who live according to their own pleasures as I did, don't get run over by them like I did. They thrive in them. They have no concern about you. Thank you for bringing my life to a terrible end so that every single day I marvel at you and at your great love for me the one who deserves nothing from you. <clears throat> I ask you to do whatever it takes to make you who you want me to be. I want to be the brightest light this side of heaven for your kingdom. I want everyone to know Jesus. There is no one beyond salvation. I, I was ridiculously offensive to you. I know how far your mercy will go. Thank you for giving us this amazing task of representing you, the gospel in its true form and for giving us a passion to keep it holy, just as you are holy. Thank you for drilling us with the need for purity, purity in every way. May we walk in purity in every way. I ask that you would Help us to never miss the opportunities that you are sending our way. Help us not to get so bogged down in our heads that we miss anything. We want to be ready, willing, and operating for you at all times. We want to be the one you can count on. So we ask you to start fires out there in the hearts of those who will. You know those who would receive you. I ask that you bring a harvest in of those people. Bring them in before time is up. 
I ask that you would help us to see them too, the ones around us. Give us grace to see those who would be harvested if someone would tell them. We love you, Jesus. We surrender every single thing in our lives to you and ask that you would be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.